Good evening. I'm Barbara Ferrer, Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. And thank you for joining me for this virtual town hall for parents and teens. I'm here with the Superintendent of Los Angeles County Office of Education, Dr. Deborah Duardo, County Health Officer, Dr. Muntu Davis, Dr. Nava uh, Yegane, who is helping to lead the effort to get children vaccinated across the county, uh, the Director of Cardiovascular and School Health, Dr. Eloisa Gonzalez, and the Associate Chief of the Healthcare Outreach Unit, Dr. Naman Shah. We're going to be answering questions tonight about the COVID-19 vaccine and the recent expansion of eligibility to teens ages 12 to 15. We're going to also talk about what we know about vaccine safety and how you're able to get yourself vaccinated if you're a teen. To start, I want to tell you a little bit about how tonight will go. Uh, we're going to begin with brief remarks from several of our panelists, and then we're going to spend the bulk of the time answering your questions. As a reminder, you can send your questions to, on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. Y si quieres escuchar en español, por favor llamas al 1-888-664-1450. Hey, buenas noches a todos. Many of you have already been aware that last Wednesday, the Food and Drug Administration approved the use of the Pfizer vaccination in teens 12 to 15 years old, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention then validated the safety and effectiveness of this vaccine for this age group. As such, vaccination sites across LA County began vaccinating younger teens the very next day. And all eight county sites have been offering the Pfizer vaccine for teens ever since Thursday. At our Balboa Park site on Saturday, where I was working, there were hundreds of teens that showed up to get their first dose. Many were relieved and some who were scared but determined to get back to doing activities they so missed this past year. I know that for many, this is a hard decision. And I encourage those not yet sure about when and if to get vaccinated to talk with your friends and family who already were vaccinated. Many of the fears are based on false information circulating widely through social media, including that the vaccines are linked to infertility or they can make others sick. Neither of these frankly is possible. These vaccines do not affect fertility nor can someone get sick from you because you were vaccinated. There's no COVID-19 virus, dead or alive, in any of these vaccines. I think I can speak for everyone on the panel when I say that we hope to clear up a lot of this misinformation tonight. And then again, we're here to answer your questions moving forward. Because the vaccines are very powerful tools that prevent so many people from getting sick and dying, it's important that we are providing you with accurate information. While our numbers are down in LA County, every day I still report that there are about 300 new cases on average, 350 to 375 people hospitalized, and five people who die from COVID-19 daily. For the most part, none of the people newly infected in the hospital or who passed away were fully vaccinated. So the best way to end the pandemic is pretty clear, since the vaccines provide the most protection from getting infected and hospitalized from the COVID-19 virus. For tonight's town hall, we've received hundreds of questions. And while we won't be able to get to all of them, we're going to do our very best to answer as many as possible. And as a reminder, you can still send your questions in the chat on YouTube or Facebook or send us your question on Twitter. In a few minutes, Dr. Duardo will discuss what vaccinating teens means for schools and how schools are partnering with the Department of Public Health on vaccination efforts. Dr. Davis will talk about how the FDA and the CDC determined the vaccine was safe and effective for 12 to 15 year olds and how vaccinating teens does help slow the spread. And finally, Dr. Yagane will discuss what a teen needs to do to get their vaccine, where to find information on what sites are offering the Pfizer vaccine, and a bit about what to expect after you get vaccinated. 
Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Shaw will be joining the presenters to answer your questions. We hope that by sharing information uh, that's important and answering your questions tonight, we'll continue to be able to work together to bring an end to the pandemic. Thank you again, mil gracias a todo for joining us tonight. And now I wanna turn it over to Dr. Eduardo, the superintendent of the LA County Office of Education and really a champion uh, of all of our efforts uh, to really make it through this pandemic by caring for all of our children. Thank you, Dr. Duardo, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer. And um, it's so wonderful to be here with all of you. And I wanna thank everyone who's joining us here tonight. It's so important that we come together and that we have these conversations and that everybody has the facts around what it means to get vaccinated. This week is a really big step in the effort that we've been making to vaccinate LA County, because this is the first time that the vaccine is eligible to our children who are age 12 years and older. The LA County Office of Education has been providing guidance, expertise, and support to 80 districts here in Los Angeles that serve children K through 12th grade during this COVID pandemic. And we're doing everything possible to make sure that our districts have accurate information and that everybody is on the same page. The next step now in this journey is to collaborate as we have been with the amazing Dr. Ferrer and her team at the Department of Public Health. We need to bring the Department of Public Health, our school districts, and our healthcare partners all together to make sure that we're all aligned and very clear on how parents can get their children vaccinated. We recently opened eligibility, as I said, for 12 year olds and older, which means that hundreds of thousands of students are now able to receive the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine, which is the only vaccine available for children in that age range. Vaccinating our students in this age group means more protection for themselves, for their fellow students, for all of our teachers and education staff, and everyone's families and loved ones. There are 80 school districts serving over 1.3 million students in LA County. And that's a lot of people. So our focus in this effort right now is making sure that school districts are paying very close attention to the most underserved and the hardest hit communities of this pandemic. LACO, along with public health, are working together to implement two vaccination strategies. Number one is onboarding school-based clinics as COVID-19 vaccine providers. And number two is organizing school site pop-up clinics Several of our school districts are interested in hosting vaccination clinics for students, their families, and the community. Our schools want everyone to be safe. So school site pop-up clinics are vaccine clinics held at school one time or on a semi-regular basis. Pop-up clinics utilize school grounds such as a parking lot, gymnasium, or an auditorium. Overall, LACO and Public Health are connecting healthcare partners with school districts to create these new vaccine opportunities and creating a schedule of school vaccine clinics. Again, the idea is making it as simple as possible for our families. We are committed to helping families that might not otherwise have the opportunity to get a free vaccine at an easy, accessible location where they feel safe to make every single school as safe as possible from COVID-19, it is critical that our school districts across the country have easy access to the vaccine and that they have good information about protecting yourself from the virus. So we are very excited. We applaud every student who gets vaccinated because by doing that, they're taking care of themselves, they're protecting others, and they're protecting their communities and their families in the best way possible. So thank you very much. And I'm glad to be here later in case there are any questions. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Duardo. And now we'll go to Dr. Davis. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Dorado, and thank you everyone who has joined us tonight for this evening's town hall. Uh, last week, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention affirmed the recommendation by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, to expand the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for adolescents 12 to 15 years of age. On Thursday of last week, the Los Angeles County vaccination providers uh, began offering the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds at vaccination sites that offer the Pfizer vaccine. Pfizer was the first to submit trial data and Moderna is expected to submit trial data on the 12 to 15 year old age group in the coming weeks and months as well. Johnson & Johnson is currently uh, in clinical trials for the 12 to 17 age group. Many people are wondering why the vaccine has just been approved for people who are ages 12 to 15. Vaccine trials and approvals commonly begin with adult uh, populations who are often more vulnerable uh, and then extend to younger ages. Adolescents were the next group to be prioritized in vaccine trials because they are most similar to adults and are more likely than younger kids to spread the virus and become seriously ill. This approach balances the need of safety and speed while protecting our children throughout vaccine development. Both Pfizer and Moderna have ongoing clinical trials in people younger than 12. Depending on the outcome of those trials, authorization for the next age group could happen later this year. Johnson & Johnson is currently in clinical trials for the, uh, the age uh, 12 to 17 age group. We're grateful to the scientists and clinicians and young people who participated in the clinical trials that helped the FDA and the CDC determine that the vaccines are safe and effective for this age group. Opening vaccine, vaccines to even more people means not only more protection for this new group of young people, but it also means we get another step closer to achieving community immunity and moving forward to a post-pandemic world. The past 14 months have been incredibly difficult, uh, including for our young people, and vaccinations will open up more possibilities for them to be safer at school, to spend time with friends, to attend parties and graduations, and to be able to participate in their favorite activities. Now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nava Yagane uh, from Public Health's Acute Communicable Disease Program. She'll give more uh, in details on vaccinating young people in LA County. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Hi, everyone. I am a pediatrician, and I think that as a pediatrician, my role is always to advocate for children. And although children, thankfully, don't suffer the same rates of hospitalizations and deaths, they do contract COVID-19, and tragically, some adolescents have become very ill, have been hospitalized, and in the United States, hundreds have died. Adolescents can also spread coronavirus to their peers and to their families, and for this reason, vaccination is so important to protect your children and to also reduce COVID-19 spread to your family and to your community. Of course, as Dr. Davis mentioned, outside of physical health, adolescent lives have been severely affected by the pandemic. They've had to cope with trauma, illness, disruption to their social, emotional, economic, and academic well-being. They've missed out on so many experiences this past year, from essential activities like going to the school or going to the library, but also very important social milestones like birthday parties, prom, graduation, sporting events. Vaccinating children will not only protect their health, but it also will allow them to fully engage in all the activities that are so important for their growth and for their development. So now I'm going to go through the steps you need to take to get your child the vaccine. As has been alluded to by uh, the other presenters, children from 12 to 17 can only get the Pfizer vaccine. So when you're booking an appointment at a vaccination site, make sure it is offering Pfizer. You can actually go on our website, vaccinatelacounty.com and look at our how to get vaccinated webpage. And it's before you begin section it says which vaccine is being offered. The second step is to make sure you have consent. So to get the vaccine, all minors will need the consent of a parent, a legal guardian, a foster parent, or a relative caregiver. If the legal guardian can't be at the appointment, the child should bring a written and signed consent form. Now for children who are living in out of home care, a licensed or approved foster caregiver can consent for the vaccine for the dependent youth without a need for a court order. 
So foster caregivers can include all home-based foster caregivers, such as resource families, certified family homes, and tribally approved homes, as well as children's residential providers, such as short-term residential therapeutic programs, transitional housing placement programs, and group homes. The next step is making sure you have proof of age. So the things that you can bring to show that your child is 12 years of age and higher include things like a passport, it doesn't matter if it's expired or from a different country, a birth certificate, any sort of medical document, um, like an immunization card or any sort of note from the doctor or any official document that includes a name and date of birth, including school records, report cards, et cetera. After you get the vaccine or your child gets the vaccine, um, some children, just like adults, may have some minor side effects, which is normal um, and a sign that the body is building protection. So these side effects are very similar to what adults experience. Most of it, it's pain at the injection site, but a smaller percentage will get headache, fevers, and fatigue. Others will have no side effects at all. And uh, we encourage all parents to consider enrolling your child in Be Safe, which is a free smartphone based tool that will send your family text messages and web surveys to provide personal check ins. Through Be Safe, you can report any side effects that your adolescent may experience after vaccination. We also know that parents are accustomed to vaccinating their children at the pediatrician offices. We know that there is um, schools and community centers that are already providing vaccines at these locations. And we're working with even more locations during the remaining school year and during the summer to make sure that there's easy access to vaccine for all. Of course, all of us have the same mutual goal of keeping children healthy. And vaccinations are such an important strategy to bring them one step closer to enjoying everything that they've missed out in the past year. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And, and we're going to just get started right away uh, answering all of these many wonderful questions uh, that uh, you all already uh, sent in to us. So I, I thanks so much and we appreciate uh, all of the participation and the questions are all great. Um, let me start with you, Dr. Duardo, because uh, this is a question that we received many times. Will children need COVID vaccination to attend school? later this summer or in the fall? And will they need to get vaccinated if they wanna participate in school sports? So vaccinations are not a requirement for children to attend school or, or to participate in any school activities. You know, we are using other um, mitigation uh, uh, factors such as masks and physical distancing and taking all the precautions to keep the spread um, from spreading. Thank you so much. And then, um, you know, maybe we'll we'll just uh, moving on for this theme of like, what will the fall look like? And what should we all be expecting? Uh, maybe Dr. Shaw, I'm wondering if you could answer this question. Will children who are vaccinated with the COVID vaccine be required to receive a booster shot in the coming months or as we head into the fall and winter? Thanks for that question. So we're still learning a lot about the longevity of vaccines and their effect on different variants that might emerge. It does seem from all the data we have that the vaccines are really, really superb, even against the lead variants. And their protection lasts at least six months and likely longer. So while we may see a booster shot in the future, it's too early to tell, and I don't think it'll be in the fall. Oh, thanks. That, that was uh, super helpful. I know that that's, that's also another question we got multiple times. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez, I'm wondering, um, this is again a, an issue top of mind for so many, both teens and their parents. How safe is the vaccine for girls since the age range is in the puberty period? In older women, I've heard that they found blood clot related issues and menstrual period abnormalities. Uh, well, what we, we do know is that um, after clinical trials showed COVID-19 is safe and highly effective in protecting uh, from severe illness and hospitalization and deaths in those aged 12 to 15, then that's when the FDA granted emergency use to the Pfizer vaccine um, for this next eligible age group. 
Um, the Western State Scientific Safety Review Work Group uh, has convened, convened immediately upon CDC's review of the FDA's authorization, um, issuing its recommendations just days later. Uh, this is the same vaccine already safely administered to millions of California adults and uh, including uh, children, uh, minors aged 16 and 17. Um, so I, we, there's no reason to believe um, after all of this has been um, published and reviewed uh, by the highest authorities that there's any reason to believe that it would not be safe or that it would cause any negative effect on uh, children's reproductive organs. Oh, thank you so much. And there's a couple of, of similar questions just about other concerns that parents have. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, maybe uh, you could weigh in. Is the vaccine safe for a child with Rett syndrome? That's a great question. And, and for those of you who don't know, Rett syndrome is a rare uh, genetic disorder um, that uh, shows up early in life. Um, and at this point, at least in terms of the vaccines, uh, the only contraindications are a severe allergic reaction uh, you know, to a component of the, the vaccine. Uh, and uh, there's nothing, no other condition has been identified um, as a, a contraindication or reason to not get it. Um, I will say also that um, you know, for a, a person or a child with Rett syndrome, um, may also be at increased risk uh, for complications from getting infected with COVID-19. But as usual, you know, talk to your provider uh, about your, your child's specific situation and their circumstance. Uh, but at this point, there's no evidence that there's a contraindication uh, to getting it because a person has Rett syndrome. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Davis. And I'm, I'm going to continue on this theme. So, so maybe you can just take this next one. Uh, if a child has a nut allergy, latex allergy, cat and cat allergy, is it safe for them to get the vaccine? Uh, yes, it is. Um, again, the only uh, severe uh, allergies or allergic reactions, if someone's had a severe allergic reaction to a previous vaccine uh, or component of the COVID-19 virus, uh, that's something to watch out for. But otherwise, your, your common food, pet uh, allergies, uh, dust mites, et cetera, uh, are not uh, issues or, or of concern in relationship to the COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Eduardo, I, I think this is a, a good question, and maybe you, you can weigh in on it. Um, since some children uh, returning to school or even going to summer school, uh, especially teenagers, may be vaccinated and other students will not, what are the plans that schools have to allow those students that are vaccinated to have more flexibility uh, around distancing and masking than students that are not fully vaccinated? Well, even if everyone has been fully vaccinated, we're still going to follow the protocol of maintaining that physical distancing uh, and wearing masks. And that's gonna be taking place for a while until we've been told by, by all of you, uh, medical doctors and um, health experts of when it's safe. Uh, you know, there's no way that we can be sure in terms of which students have been vaccinated and which haven't. We don't want to discriminate or make any child who hasn't been vaccinated feel like they're going to be bullied or picked on. So the best thing for us to do is just to continue with all of the um, health provisions that are in place to ensure safety. Yeah, that's I, I and I think we concur with you for now, as everyone knows, we're, we're going to continue wearing masks. And since in many classrooms, there are, as you noted, both children who have been able to get vaccinated and those who have not. Um, I think uh, in the near future, we can expect at least in all of our indoor settings that we're going to be continuing to wear our masks uh, for a while to come. Uh, Dr. Shah, I wonder if uh, there's a there's a, a, a couple of questions, uh, you know, in, in this sort of same vein, uh, again, of, you know, sort of specific illnesses that children may have and their ability to go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, can a child who had MISC get vaccinated? It's a great question. And MISC, for those of you who aren't aware, is multisystem inflammatory syndrome. It occurs in children, and it's a specifically severe form of COVID. This past pandemic year, thousands of children have been hospitalized with MISC, and many hundreds have died, unfortunately. Uh, because it's a particularly severe form of COVID, the CDC now recommends that children who have had it may get vaccinated to protect them in the future. 
but they should wait 90 days uh, from their hospital discharge before receiving the vaccine. Thank you. And, and I'm going to uh, also, you know, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Yaganane to also uh, weigh in on, on a couple of these questions uh, around the, the vaccine and, and how should children get it and when should children get it. Uh, we have a question, uh, is the same dosage being given to children, uh, teens, uh, 12 to 15, as to those that are 16 and older? Yes, that's a great question. And um, it is the same dose. It's the 0.3 mLs um, that we're giving to adults. We're giving that same dose to teens. Um, and that is commonly what we do with teens. Most of the vaccines we give teens are the same doses that we give to adults. Um, and they look to make sure that it is a safe and effective dose um, before before they start the trial. So um, it does seem to be highly effective and very safe. Oops. Um, thank you so much for that. And and maybe Dr. Gonzalez, you, you could help with a couple of, of questions. Um, is it safe for my son who's already vaccinated to visit me at home? I'm not vaccinated yet. I'm diabetic uh, and I have other illnesses as well. Uh, I couldn't, I refused to get the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, um, but it was the only one that was offered to me since I'm bedridden. Okay, well, thank you for that question. Uh, we do uh, have, as you know, three vaccines available. Uh, if there's only one that sh um, this person is asking is able to get um, and she's refusing it, that, that's unfortunate. But if the son or daughter is, or any child is already fully vaccinated, remember to be fully vaccinated, it means you've gotten all the required doses. If it's one or two doses, depending on what brand of vaccine you got and two weeks have passed. So that means you're fully vaccinated and you are now protected. So if your child is already in that fully vaccinated phase, then it should be fairly safe. Um, though I would probably still recommend that, you know, everyone wear a mask just because you do seem to be at higher risk as you've described your condition. So that would make things just safer for everyone in the household. Um, for you to be able to still be able to interact. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Yagane, I'm just going to go back to you because, you know, you are you are the lead person on really helping to set up systems for teens to get vaccinated. And we have a few questions about consent forms. Um, uh, do I have to sign a consent form uh, before my child can get vaccinated, even if I'm with my child? Uh, do the consent forms uh, get sent home with us if our children are going to be vaccinated at school? Um, and uh, can I sign a consent form and send my child with the consent form already signed to school to get vaccinated? Yeah, this has been um, a lot a lot of discussion around consent forms recently with the 12 to 15 year olds, and we're trying to make it so um, you know, we do have consent because we do think it is important for everyone who's less than 18 years of age to um, have a legal guardian consent for the child to get vaccine. Um, different schools are doing different things. So if you are working with a school district, I would um, make sure that you communicate with them. At our LA County sites and many of the different sites that we are partnering with, we are asking for a parent to accompany the child if the parent cannot accompany the child because there's a dual working family and the hours don't work out we are asking that they send um, the child in with the signed consent form if you're under the age of um, 15 you should have an adult with you and so there's a space on our consent forms where you write the name of the adult who is accompanying the child who has a signed consent form so um, we are asking for the signed consent form and I think many school districts are doing some version of this um, where they're trying to make sure the parent is aware that the child is getting vaccinated um, and having some flexibility and trying to do outreach to the parents if the, the signed consent form is not completed appropriately, but um, we do really encourage it. Thank you. Uh, it, is, it is so complicated. We get asked a lot of questions about that. So thanks a million for, for clarifying for everyone. 
Uh, Dr. Eduardo, we have a few questions that came in about graduations at schools. Um, you know, one is just what will happen at schools for graduations? And uh, for high school graduations, are you going to be requiring that students uh, get vaccinated? Really good question. So we're not going to require that students be vaccinated to participate in the graduation ceremonies. And then you have to remember with 80 school district, each school district has their own board of directors. So it could be different um, in terms of the type, they won't require vaccination, but it could be different in terms of the type of graduation that they're planning. Most of the districts are planning to do some type of in-person instruction Again, they'll have to make sure that they have a space large enough to meet the physical distancing requirements. Everybody will be wearing masks. They'll do it in a very safe way. Um, but you should check with your local school district to find out what their plans are for their uh, graduation ceremony. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's, such, that's such wise advice um, because there are gonna be many different ways to celebrate. I do wanna be clear uh, we do have a, a, a guidance, which is really a directive uh, that sets the minimum standards for graduations. Uh, and right now all graduations do have to be outside. So I, I wanna just make sure parents understand and, and graduates understand uh, that for safety reasons, um, you know, since we're still really, um, you know, fighting against uh, community transmission, uh, graduations will be happening outside. There'll be distancing and there'll be requirements around wearing masks as well. Um, you know, Dr. Dr. Davis, uh, also a, a lot of questions that, that maybe you can best advise as the health officer. Um, there are questions about what, uh, what are the, you know, this is who, what can happen, not just with graduation, but with events to celebrate graduations? What are the rules for events that people wanna hold after their child or a friend has graduated? That's a great question, and I, I've I've heard this a lot from from family and friends as well. Uh, you know, for you know, people can you know rent a space uh, and follow what what we have as a private events uh, protocol, uh, just in terms of of having that event uh, with an invited uh, list of guests uh, who are known to be coming, uh, and there are limits in terms of whether or not it's indoor and outdoor, uh, and those uh, protocols are are on our website uh, for people to follow. Uh, and then there's also guidance related to informal social gatherings. And that's where um, oftentimes what you'll see is somebody wants to stop by the house or a group of people or a number of people are gonna come through the house, uh, you know, to say congratulations. Uh, and there's some guidance in relationship to informal social gatherings as well. And that's also available on our website. Uh, so those things can happen just with some safety modifications uh, and those provide all the details there. You know, Dr. Davis, since we got so many questions about this, I mean, maybe you could just go through just sort of the basics on indoors and outdoors and what's allowed on sort of those informal gatherings, because I have a feeling a lot of these questions are about, like, I want to hold a party. Um, yeah. So let me go to um, private events. Uh, we'll start there. Just, uh, you know, a lot of people want to, to rent out some space uh, in order to invite people in. And this is um, can be complicated, just but you have to pay attention to one, where the event's going to be held, and two, uh, if people are fully vaccinated or they've recently tested negative uh, to for having COVID nineteen. Uh, so if people are fully vaccinated, uh, then you can have a small group of attendees, fifty or less. Uh, indoors uh, in order to and you eat and drink without, you know, masking and physical distancing. Uh, and uh, in, if it were uh, outdoors uh, and people are fully vaccinated, again, uh, you can do it without uh, physical distancing uh, and masking. Uh, again, the numbers are limited in that regard, uh, just in terms of how many people you could have in the space. Um, I will say, and that's just a couple of examples of it, um, if people are not tested, not fully vaccinated, uh, you don't know that, um, then outdoors your maximum is going to be 200 people. Uh, and if they are tested negative uh, or, uh, or uh, fully vaccinated and there's proof shown of that, uh, then it can be larger up to 400 people. Um, the easiest way to find out about the private events is to, again, look at our, our website, publichealth.lacounty.gov. 
uh, under uh, our orders, um, there is a protocol entitled Appendix BB, and it has a nice summary table uh, to let you know what you can do given the circumstances with who's coming in, uh, again, whether they're fully vaccinated and tested, meaning all of them, um, or if some aren't, you know, what you can do and some of the requirements in regards to that. Um, so that, that one is, is available on our website uh, and easy to look at. Um, when it comes to uh, these informal uh, social gatherings, uh, that one is, uh, you know, where, again, you don't have an invited guest list. Uh, you can have people outdoors, uh, up to 100 people. You still have to, to do masking and physical distancing. Uh, and indoors, you can do it. It's strongly discouraged. Uh, and the recommendation is to limit it to 50% of the capacity of that indoor space, uh, whatever that limit is, uh, or to 50 people, whichever is fewer. And again, if everyone is fully vaccinated, uh, no need to wear masks, no need to do physical distancing, uh, but everyone should be fully vaccinated in that space, uh, possibly with the exception of one household that is not fully vaccinated and, is, and the members of that household are at low risk for uh, severe illness from COVID-19. Uh, but again, uh, those are some highlights of it. Again, there's a lot more detail and guidance in both of those documents, but hopefully that helps to give a little bit of insights. Yeah, I think that was great. And and please be sure to go to our website, you know, for, for more detailed information on just about any topic we're talking about tonight. There's also a lot of information in Spanish. Um, so, you know, feel free again in Spanish and in other languages. We really have almost everything translated into about eight uh, different languages. So hopefully you'll be able to get the information you need in more detail on the website. Uh, Dr. Shaw, I know you can answer this question because you've been asked this a lot. Is there a blood test that measures the amount of antibodies in our bodies after we received both vaccines? Because I want to make sure I'm fully vaccinated. So if you've received both doses of either Pfizer or Moderna or one dose of J&J &J, and you're two weeks after your final dose, you are fully vaccinated. There are a certain small group of people who might be on medications that interfere with the vaccine whose doctors might recommend an antibody test. For most people, an antibody test is not necessary. The vaccines, in addition to creating antibodies, also help with a number of other immune responses which cannot be easily measured. So our recommendation is don't worry, you're considered safe unless your doctor advises you to get tested otherwise, and um, you'll end up with a confusing test and probably an inappropriate one. Remember that not all the antibody tests offered out there measure for the antibody produced by the vaccine. Thank you so much. Uh, there were a few questions on that, like how do I know I'm fully vaccinated? So. Uh, really, if you've gotten both doses of Pfizer or Moderna, I think Dr. Shaw said it best, uh, or one dose of, of Johnson & Johnson, you are fully vaccinated. And, you know, the evidence to date really indicates these are pretty powerful vaccines with very, very few people, uh, a handful of people out of millions and millions of people getting infected after they were fully vaccinated. Um, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, we, we have a couple of questions about uh, getting that second shot. Um, is it wrong to receive a second dose if it's been more than two weeks since you received your first dose? Uh, two weeks? Uh, well, so the- depends. More than two weeks, if it's been well, more than two weeks. Okay, so the, you know, for the Pfizer dose, uh, vaccine, we know that that needs to be administered three weeks uh, apart. So dose one today, dose two in three weeks from now. So if an individual is only two weeks out, that's still within enough time. They have another week still left to go before they go back for their second dose. Do you want to talk a little bit about Moderna as well? Uh, sure. Um, so, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the, the Moderna part of the question. Um, so Moderna is just four, is, uh, four weeks apart. So for those individuals, and Moderna is not approved for youth at this time. It's only for those 18 and over. Same with Johnson & Johnson. It's only available for those 18 and over. Uh, but for Moderna, it's also two doses, but those, dose, those doses are spaced four weeks apart compared to Pfizer, which are spaced three weeks apart. And then Johnson & Johnson is just a one and done. So more convenient. I'm just going to follow up with you because there's another question that says, what if I've missed 
the time period and I'm late now. I was supposed to come back uh, for my Pfizer dose or really in this case, it was a, a teen. I was supposed to come back for my Pfizer dose in three weeks and it's now been five weeks. What should I do? Thank you for that question. I think a lot of folks might have, uh, you know, come up uh, in that same situation uh, for, you know, reasons beyond their control. And, and that's okay. We understand that. Just get the vaccine as soon as you can, uh, close as possible to the time that you were scheduled to get that second dose. But if it's, you know, five weeks from instead of four weeks or four weeks instead of three weeks, um, you'll still uh, be able to get that second dose. You don't need to start over again with a first dose. So just get it as soon as possible. Um, after the date that you were supposed to get it. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Duardo, just a, a couple more questions that came in uh, about uh, what uh, parents and, and students should expect at school. Um, these are really questions also about um, safety over the summer. So these are questions about activities that may be happening at schools over the summer and whether or not um, you are going to be requiring students to wear their masks when they're outdoors um, if they're really doing sports, if they're doing mostly sports activities. I'm trying to combine a few questions here, Dr. Duarte. Well, first of all, I just want to reassure parents that schools have done an excellent job in preventing the spread of COVID-19 and have followed all the health orders. So, uh, you know, wearing the mask, making sure children are washing their hands, having the physical distance, you know, signage to make sure everybody knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And I can tell you, I've spent all week, uh, the, or the past two weeks, visiting schools that have reopened um, and everybody is doing great. You see little TK uh, and preschoolers with their masks on. And, you know, this far into this pandemic, they're all comfortable with it and they're doing it. You know, we're following the health orders. So when it comes to sports, you know, if a student is doing a sport where they are doing something um, that doesn't involve other students, such as running or they're, you know, if that physical distance is apart, then there's no need for them to have that mask on. However, if they're close to other students, they will need to have a mask. Again, um, not all students have been vaccinated and we want to make sure everybody is as safe as possible. But teachers and counselors and aides are looking at children. If they see a child needs a mask break, you know, they'll recommend that they take some time apart from other people and take their mask off and, and, and allow them that opportunity to just, you know, take a little break from their mask. But as long as they're around other children uh, and other people um, to ensure that there isn't a spread, we will continue to um, follow the health orders and ask them to keep their masks on. Oh, thanks so much for that. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Yegan, I, I think this is also a, a very important question, um, and I haven't actually seen it before, but, um, but I understand uh, how important it is for us to answer this. Uh, there is a question about uh, how do we, how does a parent know uh, if a mobile site that's just popping up is legitimate? Uh, what should somebody look for to make sure that they're actually being appropriately vaccinated by people who are actually trained to give them the vaccine. And actually anybody on the panel could chime in. That's a really great question. And I do wanna say that most of the mobile clinics that are popping up at schools and at camps and at community centers, are that the, there's a collaboration that happens with the school. Um, so the school has reached out, we have talked to the school, we are, um, they're doing the outreach. So the school is letting their parents know, they're not letting anyone who might be interested know. So there is that communication that's happening. Um, and so as far as school-based and community-based clinics, a lot of them are being, we are partnering with um, these local organizations and schools. So they are doing the outreach. Um, so if you are seeing a mobile clinic and the school doesn't know anything about it and the community you know, rec center doesn't know anything about it or the church doesn't know anything about it, I think then I would maybe um, you know, want to get more information about that. You can also um, reach out to us. We do have something on our website where it does um, you know, provide information for people who are interested in mobile teams. Um, so we can tell you more about that. Um, I'm, would love to hear what other people think too, though. Yeah, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Davis, do either of you want to chime in as well? 
I think Dr. Yagata answered it well. I don't have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, we'll say one thing. One is we generally list every site that's offering vaccines on our website. So if you really are, are concerned, you know, feel free to go to our website. Um, and I do think it is important to note that almost all of the mobile clinics have a partner or there's um, some, somebody there that will indicate that they're working with the Department of Public Health. Um, but if, again, you feel suspicious uh, that something doesn't seem right, uh, then I would just urge folks to not get vaccinated until you can verify uh, that this, the mobile site that you've seen pop up is in fact uh, a legitimate site. And that was a great question. Um, I do wanna note that the sites that are operating at schools are all legitimate sites uh, and they've all really worked closely both with us and with the school districts um, to get set up. Um, Dr. Davis, um, a, a couple of other questions that, that maybe you can help with. Uh, can students transmit the virus right after getting the vaccine? And will this happen if they get vaccinated at school and they stay there for the rest of the day? So um, a couple things in that, but before I answer that, I wanna clarify something because I threw out a lot of numbers on the private events. And I'm sure people heard, you know, I can have 400 people <laughs> outdoors if I have fully vaccinated people and test negative. Um, and when I said all, you know, who are fully vaccinated, you don't have physical distancing and you don't have masking. Those numbers are actually smaller. So if everyone is fully vaccinated and there's proof of that, indoors, there are 50 people or less. And for outdoors, it's 100 people or less, okay? Um, again, that's everybody fully vaccinated, but it's not that that larger number that I showed. Again, look at the protocol uh, to make sure you, you follow what is uh, your situation in that regard. But I do want to clarify that. Um, and uh, in terms of transmission of, of the, the virus, um, there is a, a chance that if someone is already infected with the virus, um, may not be showing any symptoms or may later develop symptoms and gets vaccinated in between that time, uh, that there is a possibility of uh, transmitting it, uh, you know, to, to other people. Um, you know, and if the test comes back positive and they didn't have symptoms, they'll look back a couple of days to see who they were in contact with. Uh, but there is that possibility when you're in between that time and you're not designated as fully vaccinated, uh, having had that second dose for Pfizer and Moderna two weeks later, you're fully vaccinated or the single dose of Johnson & Johnson, and I'm speaking generally, uh, two weeks after that, that single dose, you're fully protected. Uh, but there is that, that possibility of being infected and transmitting in between that time. So if this question was about if my child gets vaccinated, can they transmit the virus? And if they can transmit the virus because they just got the vaccine, should they be allowed to stay in school? There's absolutely no way somebody who was vaccinated with any of the vaccines that, uh, that are on the market now that you can get here in the United States. There's absolutely no way you can get vaccinated and transmit this virus. So the vaccines themselves cannot right. infect you. Because um, I, I know, I, I, think, I think this question was asking a couple of things and, uh, but I wanna be clear, you know, just so that there's no confusion here. The vaccine in and of itself does not infect anybody. It's completely impossible for you to get infected because you got vaccinated. And when you hear stories of people saying, you know, I got vaccinated and the next day I got sick and I went and got tested and I got COVID, so the vaccine must have given me COVID, that's actually not what happened. What happened is you were probably already infected. Uh, and when you got vaccinated, the vaccine really uh, at that point could not completely fight against the infection that was already in your body and you only got your first dose and you weren't fully protected. Uh, and so you did test positive, but it wasn't because of the vaccine. I do think there's a lot of misinformation about this um, because some people do in fact test positive, particularly after their first dose, but even after their second dose, like a couple of days after their second dose and people just assume like we all did with flu vaccine. Oh, I got the flu vaccine and a, a day later I got sick. I got sick with the flu because I got the flu vaccine. Again, not possible. It's just, um, you weren't fully protected yet. Uh, you had an exposure to the virus from somewhere else, from somebody else, and that's what made you sick. And that, in this case, is what made you 
test positive. Um, I want to go on because again, there, there's a, a, another um, a, another set of questions that I think are really interesting, and, and maybe Dr. Shaw, uh, you wouldn't mind weigh, weighing in on this. Uh, should we wait for Moderna or J and J to get my daughter her vaccine? I know they're going to be approved at some point, and I hear that the side effects from the Pfizer vaccine are worse. First, you know, I think we're so lucky in this country to have enough vaccine and to have three different amazing vaccines. Um, they're all really, really, really strong. Their side effect profiles, with the exception of sort of the rare clots with J and J, are not very different. I would personally not wait to have my child protected uh, by Moderna or J and J if Pfizer is already available right now. And you, uh, you know, I encourage everyone to make the time to go get an appointment. This is really, really important. In the clinical trials and our experience after licensing with both Pfizer and Moderna, um, their side effects uh, have been very comparable. Most people experience mild post-vaccination symptoms, body ache, headache, nausea, sometimes a low-grade fever. These typically occur one to two days after vaccination, and they go away in a day. Yeah, I, th I think it's so important. I mean, you know, because we all work a, a, a little bit at all of the vaccination sites, everybody here at the Department of Public Health, we get to talk to a lot of people. And I will say, even with my own family, 50-50, uh, with the same vaccine, we, you know, in my family, we all got Pfizer and all three of us had different reactions. Uh, you know, I really barely got ill at all from either the first or the second dose. Uh, one person in my family got really sick after the first vaccine, got very mild symptoms after the second. The other person felt nothing after the first and felt pretty lousy after the second. Um, so again, that's just one family with the same vaccine and all had a very different experience. Um, and when we work at the vaccination sites, lots of people will also tell us, you know, I really, I didn't feel anything. I was fine. Um, uh, so, so I think, um, those side effects, while, you know, they are scary for some people, you know, the idea that I'm going to get a vaccination and then I might not feel so great for a day or two. Uh, for some people, that's enough to say, you know, it's not really, I don't really want to get vaccinated because uh, I don't want to have any side effects. One, two things. One is some people do have no side effects. Um, so you could gamble on that. But the second thing is that everything we know about COVID is that the people who get sick and infected with COVID have a much worse time of it, even when they have mild illness, than anything that you're likely to experience from getting vaccinated. So we'd urge people to keep that in mind. And uh, as with many vaccines, uh, the symptoms are really mild and you can feel free if you are feeling lousy to go ahead and take that Tylenol or Advil, uh, which will help uh, help you feel a little bit better. Um, I, wanna, I wanna go on, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, maybe you could help uh, with this question uh, here, because uh, you know, again, uh, you've you've been doing a lot of talking as well uh, out in the community to so many people. Um, my question is about my daughter. She's 17 years old, and last year, everyone in my family, including her, had COVID-19. Um, she re recovered back in January, but all of a sudden, she had a nightmare about getting COVID again. I took her to get tested and she was negative, but are you sure it's okay for her to get vaccinated? Thank you for that question. And I'm sorry that your team had that uh, nightmare experience. Um, certainly not pleasant to go through something like that, but we do know that the vaccines are safe. They have been very um, studied very uh, rigorously and those Results have been reviewed by top level experts across the country. It's been very transparent how the uh, companies have been doing their studies and they've shared in detail how these have been carried out and what the results have been. So for you know individuals that are uh, going to receive some uh, vaccine that is received emergency use authorization, and it should feel some amount of confidence, a lot of confidence really, that they've gotten uh, reviewed enough by the right people who know what to look for to make sure that these vaccines are safe. And someone who's already had COVID and recovered from COVID, that is totally okay for them to still get vaccinated. Yes, having the vac uh, having the um, a COVID infection and recovering from that on your own does afford you 
protection, natural immunity we call, for you know, a few months. But we know that the vaccines actually protect you more strongly, one, and two, for a longer period of time than natural uh, immunity from infection and recovery. So we'd still urge folks um, who had uh, an infection in the past to go ahead and get vaccinated as soon as it's available to them. Uh, thanks a million. Dr. Duardo, uh, we have a couple of questions that came in about testing at schools. Um, what what are you <laughs> what are schools doing, particularly because uh, the younger students cannot get vaccinated right now around testing? And what do you think testing might look like in the fall at schools across the county? Well, we're really fortunate in Los Angeles. We got a whole lot of money millions and millions of dollars that has come in to provide school districts with the funding and support to have COVID testing available at all schools. So we are working again very closely with the Department of Public Health. We have um, many different providers that are interested in providing COVID tests. Uh, school districts have been making plans uh, and they're not all they're not all, they don't all have the exact same plan. So again, I wanna encourage you to reach out to the school where your child attends and to ask them what is their plan in terms of COVID testing. Districts will have the funding to be able to provide it. I can tell you most of the districts are already working on plans. Some are already implementing those plans to make sure that they can have COVID testing for their students and their employees again, as just another factor to make everybody feel safer about coming back to school for in-person instruction. Um, so you really need to check with your school district, but there is the funding in place and there's lots of planning. And I can tell you most of the 80 districts that I've connected with have said that they do plan to provide COVID testing. There are a few that in those communities, they feel like it's not something that they wanna offer. So it's really important that you talk to your local school district to find out what their plans are. Uh, thanks so much. And again, I'm, I'm, we're, we've been thrilled to be able to partner with all the districts and have appreciated the federal resources uh, that will help us because I think it is important to note that if you do frequent testing, which is what we're gonna be able to do, uh, it does it is very effective at helping us identify people who may be asymptomatic, uh, but still infected. And so, you know, when, when you're not gonna be able to still vaccinate so many of our younger students, uh, it will be important to have, again, that full suite of strategies, masking, infection control, distancing, but also frequent testing. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we really appreciate all the work that the LACO team is doing on getting that set up at all of the districts uh, and private schools across the county. So thanks so much for that. Um, I wanted to go a, a couple of other, you know, questions that I think uh, would be helpful for us to answer. And maybe we can start with some of these uh, with for, for Dr. Uh, Jagane, uh, because I, I think again, you've been, you know, as a pediatrician and you've also been working with, with so many families uh, and schools, um, this is a question about uh, incentivizing children to go ahead and get vaccinated. Uh, and there are a couple of parents here who have noted that my child wasn't really anxious to get vaccinated, but I am anxious for them to get vaccinated. And I've tried various strategies to make, uh, to make it easier for my child to get vaccinated. And one parent notes, including I told him he didn't have to take out the trash for a month if he would go and get the vaccine. And she noticed that he got the vaccine the very next day. What other incentives do you think we as parents could be offering to our children uh, so that they'll hurry up and uh, agree to go get vaccinated? That's a fantastic question. I know very few um, children like to get vaccines as with my experience as a pediatrician. Um, most of them try to hide when I come into the room with the vaccine. So it is a common um, complaint, I think, as far as COVID-19 and the pandemic goes, we have been doing some work with youth advisory groups and the LA Trust and different um, youth groups, uh, figuring out what would motivate individuals to get vaccinated. And what we really realized is that they, um, 
although they care about their health, um, they're really focused on making sure they don't spread disease to their family. They wanna make sure that their family is safe. And then also some of the benefits are not having to quarantine when you're traveling, not having to quarantine um, after potentially having an exposure. Um, you know, there are some things that we are providing, like a lot of, but on our guidelines, we actually say that if you're fully vaccinated, um, you don't have to participate in the screening programs that we recommend for youth sports. So I know for our athletes, a lot of times they, they you know, being quarantined and not being able to participate in games is really, um, a, you know, a, a, such a horrible feeling to let their team down. So, you know, getting vaccinated so they can play um, and not be quarantined is a big motivator. So there's different ways of thinking about it, um, but I do feel like young people are really excited to go back into the social atmosphere and being around with their friends and going to concerts and definitely um, being vaccinated will allow them to get there faster. Uh, thanks so much. We have a lot of questions about masking. So we, we dealt with a couple masking at schools, but we have just a lot of general questions. So Dr. Davis, uh, I'm gonna start with you. Um, <laughs> And on, the, on sort of the basic question that we've really been dealing with for days now. I'm confused by the CDC announcement. I am fully vaccinated. Why do I still need to wear a mask in LA County? You know, yes, we, we have been dealing with this question a lot. <laughs> um, and, you know, the truth is, um, you know, at this point, uh, the va vaccines provide a lot of protections uh, for you. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, not being infected uh, with COVID-19, not being hospitalized if you were, uh, and not dying from it. Um, however, um, there's still uh, others uh, who are still likely to, to get infected because they're not fully protected. Uh, and there's that risk of having a new virus, even though this vaccine has been protective against the current variants of the virus, uh, that there's a new variant that, um, you know, is more infectious, uh, potentially more severe, uh, because we have still have a large number of people who are not fully vaccinated. Um, so we really want to make sure that we have a good amount of uh, immunity uh, from vaccines in order to prevent the likelihood that we even uh, may have a new variant that is more concerning uh, than what we've seen so far. Uh, so we want to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody is protecting themselves. Um, the other thing is that um, as we look at this, it's, it's often very difficult for or easy for people to, to know who's fully vaccinated and who isn't. Uh, so we want to, you know, make uh, sure that uh, people feel comfortable and safe going about their daily activities. And when they're in higher risk situations, uh, you know, like an indoor environment or in a crowded situation, even at an outdoor event. Um, so masking is still required in those regards. Dr. Fair, you're muted. All right, thank you. Yeah, I wonder if I can just follow up with you, Dr. Davis, uh, on a on a sort of very similar vein. How do you manage uh, safe? How do you safely manage a fully vaccinated household that has one or two unvaccinated children? If other fully vaccinated people visit, can we all be indoors unmasked, or does my or do my children have to stay masked? or do we all need to stay outside? What are the guidelines for situations where everyone is vaccinated except the children? That's a great question. And uh, it, if the children are not at high risk, meaning they don't have an underlying condition that puts them at high risk of severe illness uh, from COVID-19, um, as long as those are the only unvaccinated uh, you know, people um, who are in that, that gathering, uh, everybody else is vaccinated, uh, then it's uh, pretty safe to, to gather either indoors or outdoors. If, however, um, you know, one of the child or both of the children are at high risk, uh, better to do outdoors, better to keep the mask on, uh, given, you know, the potential uh, severe outcome if for some reason, you know, the child gets infected or those children get infected. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I know, uh, again, I, I know there's a little bit of confusion out there. We're hoping that by having conversations with you tonight, uh, you understand that we're all wearing masks because we still need to keep protecting each other. 
Um, and it is really, really hard when you're out in public to figure out who's vaccinated and who's not vaccinated. So I think the difference is, you know, when we're outside, we're around other people, we don't know who they are, we're going to keep our masks on for now. When we're indoors at shops and stores and workplaces, we're going to keep our masks on. Uh, when you're having family get togethers, uh, or gatherings with friends and families, and most people are vaccinated except for your children, um, you're going to make an assessment based on the health status of your child and the setting that you're in, um, so that you're going to minimize, of course, those exposures. Um, but again, we are in a transition phase as we get more and more people vaccinated. And one of the reasons why we're excited about this opportunity to talk about getting teens vaccinated is the more people that are vaccinated, the just less possibility there is uh, for there to be transmission. And that's just how the numbers work with vaccines. Um, so the more people that have a vaccine, the less possibility there is for this virus to find a new home uh, should there be an infected person uh, out there in a group with other people. If everyone's vaccinated, that infected person will have almost nobody to pass along the virus to. And that helps all of us uh, by both reducing transmission and making sure we don't have more mutations of the virus around. Um, Dr. Shah, there, there are a couple of questions again um, about people who have allergies or it's sensitive to vaccines, uh, you know, still wondering, how do I know if the vaccine is safe for my child? There's one question from a parent who says, I had an allergic reaction to the vaccine. Does that mean my child will have an allergic reaction as well? Great question on allergies. A lot of children have various allergies, seasonal allergies, severe allergies. Uh, I think as Dr. Davis said earlier, unless you have a severe allergy to any of the vaccine components, there are no contraindications. Now for people who do have a history of anaphylaxis, especially to other medications and vaccines, you do get monitored for a little bit longer after your vaccine for 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes. The other question we get commonly is I'm immunocompromised or I have a weak immune system. And I think as we discuss uh, the case of the child with Rett syndrome, um, for children who are immune compromised uh, or have a weak immune system, not only is it not a contraindication to get the vaccine, it's an absolutely great idea. Um, because these same children are at higher risk of getting COVID-19. So in summary, very few reasons not to get a vaccine. And if in doubt, have a talk with your doctor. If I can add, if I can add to that, um, you know, in terms of, I think the question was really uh, also with a child, if the parent had, had a reaction to your reaction with the child. Um, one thing that we often do is um, if there's that potential and, uh, you know, nobody knows for sure, uh, but we can observe the child for longer. Uh, so maybe it's not the 15 minutes, it's the 30 minutes just to make sure uh, that there isn't some family uh, transition of, of that severe allergic reaction uh, to the child as well. But they can be observed for a longer period of time. Thanks so much. I think that's a, a good reminder that we can make adjustments. And, you know, in fact, there, there was a question about where should I take my child to get vaccinated, to get vaccinated. Should I go to a pediatrician or should I get my child vaccinated at the school? Um, I was going to, you know, just ask anybody to respond to that. But, you know, Dr. Davis, your mic's open. So, you know, I think um, wherever you feel the most comfortable, um, you know, and if you're looking to, to have your child, um, you know, have uh, to be fully vaccinated, you know, because they're going to take a trip or you're going to go to camp or, you know, something like that, then, you know, you may look at the timing. Uh, and again, you know, with Pfizer, it's going to take five weeks to get to that full, fully vaccinated uh, period of time. So timing may be, you know, your question um, at that point. Uh, but all of the providers uh, are good. All of the providers know what to do. All of the providers know uh, what to observe and, and how long to observe, what to look out for, uh, for any ser uh, serious reactions. I think it's a personal choice in terms of timing a personal choice in terms of location, uh, but in all places, you'll be taken care well, uh, well taken care of. If I could just add on, um, as a pediatrician, I do have to mention that a lot of children haven't received some of their well child checks, haven't received some of their very important vaccinations that are not COVID-19. Um, so if all things being equal and you're able to get it at both places, you might want to consider going to the pediatrician because you might actually be due for some other vaccinations or some other health um, 
maintenance. Um, and we do know that people have not been going to their doctors as regularly as they should be during the pandemic. So this might be a good opportunity to check many boxes at the same time. That's, that's a really, it was actually gonna be my next question. Uh, can the COVID vaccine be given during other routine vaccines that are being given or like Tdap? Do, do you want to go ahead? Yes, of course. So yes, um, the answer is yes. We are um, able to administer multiple vaccines on the same visit, including the COVID-19 vaccine. You're able to get a PPD placed on the same day that you get the COVID vaccine if you need that. You're able to get your physical exam forms for sports camps. Um, so there's a lot that you can do during that one visit to your doctor as well as getting your vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Eduardo, um, a, another couple of questions that came in um, that are really, uh, again, about uh, safety at for school, safety at schools for various activities. Um, so this is a question about whether or not, again, um, there's going to be requirements for vaccines for children who want to participate in some extracurricular activities that so far at this child's schools have not been open. And this is a particularly, this parent is referencing uh, dance and drama theater. Um, so this parent is wondering if schools are waiting to get children vaccinated before they allow for some extracurricular activities like dance and drama. Yeah, districts have been, you know, working really hard to follow the health orders around dance and drama and music. Uh, and, you know, all of the protocols have, have allowed those things to happen, but they have to be outside with the physical distancing. Um, you know, so schools, as I mentioned previously, are currently not recommending, I mean, requiring, and I don't believe that they will be requiring uh, students, to, it won't be mandated that students get vaccinated. So they will continue until we hear otherwise from, you know, public health that it's um, time to allow everyone back in because we've reached the herd immunity or whatever levels need to be reached. Uh, we will continue to have children wearing masks, but districts have found other ways to continue with, you know, band and music and sports and choir, just making sure that they're maintaining the physical distancing and the other um, safety measures that are necessary to prevent the spread. Yeah, thanks so much. And I, I want to really, again, thank the parents that are raising these questions um, and also commend all of the school districts and, and Dr. Duardo and her team, because I do think it's accurate to say that we're, we've been trying for the last few months to make sure that as many activities as possible were opening up for children, uh, even where we had to change them to accommodate uh, for the potential for increased risk when children are going to be doing activities that either put them closer together or are the kinds of activities where you might not be able to wear a mask at all. So I, I want to really appreciate uh, the school districts and the students, you know, who have who have uh, managed to make the adjustments so that they can try as hard as as hard as they can to get back to doing the things that they really love. Um, uh, Dr. Shaw, I have another question for you. Um, the winter surge in LA County was very scary but there are very few cases uh, anymore. How come? Is it because so many people got vaccinated or is it because so many people already had COVID? Well, I think it has a lot to do with what everyone out there has been doing and what we at the Department of Public Health have been doing. Uh, I think Dr. Frayer has been a great uh, leader in this. Uh, with our county uh, restrictions, I know they've been really, really hard on a lot of people, but they were necessary and they have worked. Uh, that's decreased transmissions combined with the fact that now almost 60% of LA County adults have received at least one dose of the vaccine uh, and 44% are fully immunized, along with people who've recovered naturally from COVID-19, although they need to get vaccinated. All of these in combination have really drove down COVID uh, to a uh, unprecedented level. And I think we're really, really happy and really, really proud of that, but it's not the time to uh, loosen our guard. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm gonna follow up maybe maybe uh, either Dr. Davis or Dr. Gonzalez. 
Uh, when will we reach herd immunity and how close are we to getting to 80% of people being vaccinated? You know, this is also a, a question that pops up a lot. <clears throat> um, you know, and, and the, you know, the 80% uh, is what we think. Um, however, you know, focusing on the number, we really uh, also have to look at the cases. Um, and the pandemic, you know, ends when enough people are protected, you know, from illness and infection and severe illness. Uh, and you can do that a number of ways. Vaccinations do help. It protects you and it protects our community. Um, if we uh, continue at our vaccination rate, it could be somewhere towards the end of July. And if, if the numbers uh, continue to drop uh, in terms of our uh, the number of vaccines that we provide each week, uh, especially for first doses, um, it may take longer. Uh, and each time that uh, a new population becomes eligible, uh, that adds another group that we uh, have to vaccinate as well. Uh, so I think, you know, as we, we look at this, um, we want to make sure that we continue to do take the precautions necessary, uh, get your vaccine vaccination um, if you're eligible to get it and, and can get it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, make sure that you're, you're uh, we're watching the case numbers and, and uh, infection rates, uh, which continue to, to be lower uh, at this point and steady. Um, it could change, but in either case, um, the pandemic ends when enough people are protected. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Davison. And we want to also appreciate everybody out there who is, as Dr. Shaw said, doing their part, following the rules, taking care of each other, keeping your distance, you know, washing your hands. Um, this is really how we do end the pandemic. And now that we've got these powerful vaccines, it makes it uh, really just much more possible uh, for us to get there quicker. Um, I do, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, I'm, I'm wondering, um, uh, we got a couple of questions about uh, switching vaccines. Um, so can someone switch to a different vaccine for their second dose if they had bad side effects the first time uh, when they got vaccinated? In this case, it was Pfizer. Can I switch? Can I take something different for the second dose if I had some bad side effects? I really felt pretty lousy uh, after I got my first dose of Pfizer. Thank you for that question. I'm sure many folks out there uh, had that same question. So thanks to the person who asked, um, gives us an opportunity to address it. So the vaccines were not studied in a mixed sort of uh, way where you have one brand for one dose and a different brand for another dose. We know that when you get um, both doses from the same manufacturer, uh, that that's what we can feel confident as you know, my colleagues have said, um, you know, two weeks after you've gotten all the doses that you have full protection. We don't know because it hasn't been studied how much of a uh, protection you'll get um, if, compared to if you had gotten the same brand for both doses. So our recommendation is always to make sure that you have both doses from the same vaccines, you know, Pfizer for both or Moderna for both, for example. So that that's what we recommend, just because we haven't studied it the other way around. It, we don't know. It may it may work still, but um, having feeling crummy after the first one um, isn't really uh, an indication for you to have to switch to the other. Um, it doesn't mean that it made you sick. It just is a reaction. It's a normal and expected reaction, showing that your body is building its immunity um, after getting that first shot. So uh, I'll share. You know, one of my family members also got. Um, you know, both doses and after both got really, you know, felt very crummy and just stayed in bed for a day. And then the next day was absolutely fine. Uh, so they're not unex uh, unexpected, these symptoms. Uh, they don't mean that you're sick. They don't mean that you got that, you know, the vaccine uh, caused you to get ill with the virus. So uh, you shouldn't be concerned. If that's your concern, then, then you want to switch to the other vaccine that, that you know, you shouldn't, uh, switch for that reason. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that. Um, Dr. Yegne, um, I there's a, another couple of questions. I'm going to try to combine them, uh, but these are from a couple of parents. Uh, I work uh, during the week. I wanted to know if the schools are going to be able to give out vaccines in the evenings or on the weekends, because I do want to go with my son to get his vaccination. Um, so the, there are going to be sites that will offer evening and weekend clinics so you can go with your child. 
Um, I know that there people are trying to figure out the times that are best for families. I know even during the summer, we're trying to think of events that um, have a large participation of adolescent kids, and many of them are during the evenings. Um, so definitely that's something that we're considering. Um, and then if it what doesn't work out, of course, you can have the consent form signed and the child can go with either another adult or um, potentially depending on the school site, they might not need to have an adult on site with them. Yeah, and I would note that uh, right now there's probably two or 300 other sites in LA County that are offering the Pfizer vaccine where you and your child can go uh, without an appointment. <laughs> Um, to go ahead and get vaccinated. And some of those offer uh, evening hours and, and many offer weekend hours. All eight county sites, um, I mean, six of the eight county sites are open on the weekends. You don't need an appointment. Um, so again, I, I'd urge people to go look at vaccinatelacounty.com, get information about all the different sites uh, that are offering the Pfizer vaccine. Hundreds of pharmacies are offering the Pfizer vaccine. And many of those pharmacies are as you know, in your neighborhoods, and they're open both evenings and on weekends. Um, so thank you so much for, for asking about that question and really making a big effort um, to, to help make sure that your child can go get vaccinated. Um, we have time just for a, a couple more questions. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, um, you know, just really open these questions for, for anybody that, that wants to take a stab at them. Um, but th this is, I, I think, again, a, a really important question. Uh, do you have concerns about the impact of emerging variants on children, given that we've seen statistics in other states of rising cases among young people? And are you concerned that because many younger children can't get vaccinated, that they could actually act as petri dishes to facilitate the growth of more vaccine resistant variants. What steps, if any, should parents take to keep their 12 and under children safe? So, you know, this is, um, you know, for anyone who um, is susceptible to being infected, there's always the chance that the, the virus will mutate uh, and become something more severe than what we've seen. Uh, so that's why even as we move forward, um, you know, taking the basic precautions, uh, you know, around washing your hands, keeping your distance, wearing your face mask, uh, or, uh, you know, is, are things that are going to be uh, needed. Um, I wouldn't want to characterize, you know, the kids as petri dishes uh, in that regard. Uh, but any person uh, that the vaccine infects, um, it can replicate and mutate. Uh, so that is, you know, why we want um, as many people as possible to be vaccinated and protected so that we don't have uh, infections that continue to fester uh, and then potentially uh, create uh, new mutants uh, uh, or mutations, uh, again, that are that are more severe uh, in terms of infections. But the basic precautions that we've been doing um, are, are the things that are needed. Uh, and then as we've relaxed, as we've seen lower rates of infection, Notice that we still do have some precautions in place, uh, and those should continue to be followed, um, you know, uh, as we continue to move forward and we continue to see infections inside of LA County. Did anybody uh, else want to just add, especially on that question of how, what steps should parents take to keep their children 12 and un under 12 uh, safe? I think Dr. Davis highlighted the fundamental basics. And to that, I would just add, you know, parents, make sure you're vaccinated because if you're vaccinated, you'll protect your kids. Any other additions to that? We'll, we'll, we'll go very quickly then uh, to the last, to the last question, um, because I think it's, it's very related to keeping younger children safe. Um, it, it's a question about um, what happens after June 15th, uh, when many of the masking requirements may go away, but we know that children under the age of 12 will not have been vaccinated. What is the advice that you would give to a parent about in a world where lots of people may not be wearing their masks, 
um, what should you do about with your children uh, in those environments? I don't know, Dr. Yagane or Dr. Gonzalez, if you want to just answer uh, before we go to closing remarks. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of uh, parents who have children less than 12 are struggling with. And I personally have two children less than the age of 12. Um, so it's definitely something in my mind. I, I do feel like we know so much about how COVID-19 is transmitted and that we know how to prevent it. We know that outdoors and is better than indoors. We know masking works. Um, and we also know that a lot of people are getting infected from family members. So even if, like Dr. Shaw said, if you could vaccinate everyone in your family, you are actually going to protect your child. Um, but definitely these are all the things that I'm thinking of when I think about my summer plans with my children is making sure to use these different pillars of infection prevention um, consistently to try to keep them as safe as possible. Dr. Gonzalez, did you want to add anything? Yeah, so I, I would just add um, to that, uh, that, you know, if, if a parent's concerned about limiting exposure, then you might want to also really think about who you exposed your child to. So um, trying to limit it to those who you know are vaccinated, whether they be family members or, you know, fam other families that, you know, where your child has playmates or friends, make sure that, you know, all the folks that are in that other household um, if your child is going to visit, to know that those other uh, eligible people in that other household are also vaccinated, even if, no, even if they're not your own family members. So just trying to, um, you know, again, just, you know, make sure that if you're concerned that you do what you can on your end as a parent to make sure that you're minimizing the exposure for your child if your child obviously is not uh, at an age where they're eligible to be vaccinated yet. Uh, so, you know, the parents have a lot of choice, a lot of control over, you know, where their children spend their time. And so I think, you know, this is this is one of the good times a parent can exercise uh, that ability to be able to manage the exposure. Yeah, this is such great advice. I, I do want to thank uh, all of the, the, the folks on our panel tonight uh, um, for, you know, really just, just sharing your wise counsel and being willing to answer these excellent questions. Uh, that so many of our parents and teens uh, sent us for tonight. Um, we're going to rapidly run out of time, so I want to just have a, a couple of closing remarks. Uh, Dr. Duardo, you know, I'd love to turn it back to you because as, as we noted tonight, uh, many parents are grateful for the opportunity to have their children back in schools, uh, but they are still looking for reassurances uh, about the safety at school. So I wonder if we can just start with you on, on closing. Sure. Um, you know, it's been a really hard year for everyone. And we've all experienced a lot of grief, a lot of isolation, a lot of, a lot of illness. But one thing that I would say to parents is that when it comes to sending your children to school, if you look at all the research in terms of the spread of COVID within schools, it's been very, very minimal. So I would tell parents, be assured that districts are following all of the protocols, making sure that people are wearing masks, that children are engaged, that they are, um, you know, addressing not only their physical needs and preventing the spread of COVID, but also just addressing their mental health and emotional needs and welcoming them back and are excited for them to be there. So a lot of appreciation to the Department of Public Health and all of the medical experts that have made it possible for schools to understand exactly what we need to do, do to be safe. And um, thankful to all of the educators, teachers, counselors, parents, students, everybody working together to keep each other safe. So thank you again, and we welcome everyone back to school. Uh, thank you. And, and maybe uh, Dr. Yagane, uh, you know, we could have you just close and then we'll go to Dr. Gonzalez and then Dr. Shaw and, and then Dr. Davis just uh, with a few closing uh, words for, for our wonderful audience tonight. Yeah, no, thank you so much for all these amazing questions. And I just want to, again, re reassure everyone that we're doing everything possible to make vaccines as accessible to everyone, um, adolescents and their families. And our goal is to do everything to allow children to socialize, play sports, um, and go to school, really enjoy school without the risk of infection and quarantining. And I'm just so appreciative of everyone's efforts to, um, to do that. So thank you. Dr. Gonzalez? 
Yeah, I'd like to join you, Dr. Ferrer, and, and my colleagues uh, for, you know, thanking everyone for doing their part um, and making sure that, you know, if you are able to get vaccinated, that you do get vaccinated, that, you know, you're wearing your mask, you're following all the protocols when you go to different settings, whether it's a school or a, a store or the movie theater. Um, I think that's gone a long way to getting us where we are now. Um, but we still have a ways to go and making sure that we get all of our youth vaccinated is really the way that we're going to be able to get more quickly to a place that where we, that appears to be more normal or what we are what we consider normal um, that much faster. So I, I would just say thanks for doing what you have and let's continue to get everyone vaccinated that we can so that we can get back to something a little bit more normal and our kids can get back to doing their favorite things. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shaw. Thanks everyone. These vaccines are a blessing. We've had more than 150 million people in the US receive at least one dose of the vaccine now. So please, it's our only way forward. It's the way out of fear. It's to protect yourself, protect your family, and to keep LA open. So everyone, thank you for those of you who have done your part and look forward to everyone else uh, seeing you at a vaccination site soon. Thank you. And uh, we'll close it out with Dr. Davis. Thank you. I want to thank everyone who spoke on the panel. Dr. Ferrer, as usual, great host uh, in terms of pulling up the questions uh, from people. Um, really great questions. I want to thank everybody who participated, submitted questions, uh, you know, to get answers, um, you know, at the moment. Um, you know, this is what we want to do. We want to meet you where you are uh, and answer your questions. Um, as we move forward, you know, I do want to acknowledge uh, what we have all said, you know, the vaccines are a blessing. Uh, you know, it's something to help us get out of this, but we also recognize that some of our population won't be able to be vaccinated and we still need to continue to take those steps. Even after June 15th, uh, if once, you know, the mask rules go away, once the sector guidance goes away, um, there will still be some smart things to do. Uh, again, many people, even if they're vaccinated, may still be more comfortable being outdoors uh, and that's always going to be safer than being indoors. Uh, and so if you are not comfortable, continue to do the things, you know, that uh, we've been doing. Stay outside, wear your mask, you know, uh, limit your gatherings with people who aren't fully vaccinated um, in terms of the time and the space that you do that in. Um, but we're at the, we're getting towards the, uh, what looks like for us in public health as towards the end with the lower case numbers. But please recognize there are still uh, a number of infections out there. So the risk is still, is still there, especially if you're unvaccinated. Uh, so take the precautions that you know of and that have been working uh, during this time. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to wish everyone good night. Uh, we will do this again and often. Um, so please, you know, continue to stay in touch with us. Um, you know, feel free to get information off of our website. Um, and again, you know, I, I talked to friends and family who have also been vaccinated to learn about their experiences. Uh, but we are here uh, to be of service. So mil gracias a todos. Uh, and we'll uh, have another town hall shortly, again, uh, to, in hopes that we can answer your questions and address your concerns. I want to thank all our panelists, especially thank Dr. Eduardo and the amazing partnership we have with the LA County Office of Education. Uh, we care deeply about every single child uh, here in the county uh, and want you to know uh, how much uh, we're hoping that uh, working by working together our children really have the best opportunity uh, to be successful and to be healthy. So with that, we wish you good night. Thank you.